Thursday, April 14th, 2022. Um, this is a special call committee meeting for rules, uh, confirmations, and elections committee. Uh, we have with us uh, the Davidson County Election uh, Commission uh, here with us. And um, I'm gonna go ahead and, and turn it over to, uh, to them so they can do introductions. So first, let me uh, thank uh, Council Lady Bircher for inviting us down. Very timely meeting where we can share some information with you. Uh, to my left here, Rick Brown. Rick does uh, the finances for the commission along with financial disclosures. So all of you have probably had a conversation with him or at least emailed in the last little while. Lisa Pierce, Lisa takes care of social media, really. Um, and anything that we put out to the press, as far as press releases, those kind of things, social media has become a very big issue for us. We have lots of people in Davidson County that get their information about elections from our social media site. Then we have Bobby Medley. Mr. Medley uh, is one of our machine technicians and has a vast amount of experience with voting in, in Davidson County. Uh, Bobby's gonna give you some information on redistricting, what we've gone through, what to expect for voting. In addition to that, um, what we'd like to do is kind of open it up to you to ask us whatever burning question you, your family, your friends have about elections. We found that a lot of the public get a lot of their information off the web, uh, not our website per se, but just the web. And that's very dangerous uh, because every state uh, does things a little different as far as voting goes. So you can't look at how we do absentee ballots and compare us to, let's say, Arizona totally different process. So an opportunity for you to ask us any questions on any subject as far as elections go. So I guess we'll, we'll start off with Rick. He'll catch you up on um, financial disclosures, what we're, we're doing. Um, recently, we've, we've sent out each of you, I think, a reminder of when financial disclosures are due, if they are due uh, at this time? I think most of the council members are not in, it's not an election year for y'all, so you don't have to do the quarterly uh, reporting this time. You'll just do the mid-year supplementals and the year-end supplementals, so it'll be July before you have to have to fool with that, but I'll be talking to you then. Um, we, I am, dealing with the pre-primary report now for several of the, the new candidates as well as those that uh, are incumbent and, and running in the May election. Um, we, did the pre the, we did the first quarter report this past April the 11th and we're about to wrap that up and then we're gonna turn around and do the pre-primary just right again. But as of right now, um, as Jeff said, I just took this over in January, so I'm learning a lot from y'all as we are learning together to, to get this information as, as, as right as we can. Uh, we have gone back to make sure that we put information out on the uh, public site all the way back to 2017 at this point. Um, we might do more if we get a chance to look at the older files and, and, and that kind of thing. Um, we do, that's pretty much where, where we stand as far as, as those are concerned. Uh, are there any questions for me? Yes. Okay. There you go, Councilwoman. <laughs> I was waiting for her to turn the mic on. Um, for the reminders um, for supplemental and year-end disclosures, I never get those. Right. Is it possible, and I think they go in the mail 
possibly to the treasurer. I don't know how that works, but I was just wondering if we could have that sent to our email addresses. That would be way helpful. Actually, before, I'm not sure that that was happening, like you said. Okay. But in for the first quarter and for this pre-primary, I am sending out emails to those that are required to send them in two weeks before they're due. Okay. So you should be looking for that sometime probably in late June because your next one will be due in July the 11th. So sometime in late June, I'll be sending those out. Um, so yes, and I am sending along with that uh, a, a PDF that shows the links and everything to our online system. Oh, good. Which um, I am highly encouraging everyone to use that because it's beneficial to both you and to me if we keep all of that inside the system. And those reports aren't going through multiple hands. I know when I took this over, I found where there were a lot of gaps and I was having to go back and find, uh, get reports from people and that's, that's difficult. You know, you, you don't wanna have to ask for that kind of information, but we, we got most of it. People were very helpful and we, we've got most of that in there. We will be uh, reminding people Good. I, the, the email reminder is going to be very helpful. It seems to sneak up on me. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you for that. Sure. Thank you, Councilwoman Johnston. You have another one? No. <laughs> I, I see uh, Councilman Rosenberg gl glaring, so I didn't know if he had, if he had a question. <laughs> yeah. I just have one too, and I try not to ask questions from uh, from the chair seat. I'm just old school. That's how we we came in. We were told, you know, not to. Anyway, so uh, on the financial disclosure, so the new process will be um, we're going to start sending uh, council members those email reminders, and for council members to utilize the online uh, reporting system for you guys. Okay. Yes, and I have worked one on one with several people in these first two yeah, to actually them. walk <laughs> them walk them through the system and get them set up and registered and logged in so that they can actually file a report and I'm willing to do that. Just give me a call. That's perfect. Mm -hmm. Our, our goal on the financial disclosures is to have everything out on the website so that we avoid the possibility of citizens, whoever, going out there not seeing what they think they should see, and then they contact the state registry, and that starts going down a path that nobody wants to really go down. Uh, we would like to avoid that at, at all costs. So Rick is there to help. Just give him a call, send him an email. He will walk you through the process. Okay, thank you so much. So I think that covers financial aid, uh, financial aid, financial disclosures. Um, can we just jump into uh, the redistricting? If we can, if we can jump into that real fast. Sure. Let's let's let uh, Bobby Medley uh, kind of give you some facts and figures on the changes. So I just did a little recap of what we went through for the last what two months, and uh, I'm gonna throw a lot of numbers and st stats at you. Just interrupt me or pause if you have any questions. So. We went from 244 precincts pre-redistricting to 304. 304 precincts is identified as an individual block of voters. We went from 160 polling locations to 179. Our first run was at 193, and after receiving voter numbers from Jeff and Jeremy, uh, we were able to get that consolidated down to 179. So we have 179 polling locations now in Davidson County. Uh, Pre-redistricting, we were at 59 polling locations that were split, and we are now at 94. A split is identified as having two or more House people, two or more Congress, two or more school board members. If we didn't do that, we would have to have, of course, the 304 precincts, which is unrealistic. Uh, every polling location was used pre-redistricting except for one. The uh, Boy Scouts of America was not needed. Calvary Church was able to absorb that. So we still are using every voting polling location that we had pre-redistricting. The breakdown of the additional sites that we had to add, we added 14 schools. We tried to concentrate on schools. Uh, 
as far as additions, community centers three, we added three new churches, two libraries, two metro facilities, and one even fire hall. Uh, we are up to now 77 private facilities in the county and 102 public facilities. We try to use the public if at all possible. Just some other interesting facts, the uh, 17 polling locations in the 17th, 17th Senatorial District, 59 in the 19th Senatorial District, 58 in the 20th, 45 in the 21st. The congressional breakdown as far as voters, that's what most people like to hear or read, is the 5th Congressional District has approximately 230,000 registered voters, the 6th Congressional District has 125,000, and the 7th half 120, has 125,000. The Council District with the most most precincts is nine, and that's in the 10th Congressional, uh, 10th Council District, and the one with the least is the 9th and the 18th. They only have three. It's just the way the geographical it works, and we were able to consolidate them. Some of our smallest sites, you're not going to believe this, is Unit Baptist Church with 31 voters in that polling location. That is because of the Senate lines. You cannot join Senate lines by state law. Watch Creek Pike Fire Hall has 35, and a Park Avenue school has 67. Those are all because of Senate lines. Our three largest locations now will be the Westmead School, Belmont Sports Signs, and the Tuscum uh, Church Christ. They all have around 6,000 registered voters. Uh, we have nine doubles. I can read those off if you'd like. We have nine double precinct. A double precinct is when you have two polling locations in the same facility. For example, West End Middle School. They've always been a double. It works great. They're in the gym, but we're using uh, Julie Green School. Bellevue United Methodist has always been a double. It, it actually works pretty good. Uh, school board and polling locations, if, if you would like to know those, I can read those off to you as far as how many polling locations are in each school board. And uh, that's about all I have. We have 55 in this particular election. We have 55 ballot styles, 50 Democratic styles, and five Republican styles. You have the 35 individual council members running by committee persons, men and women. Then you'll throw in the school board, the even school boards into that. That's how it comes up to 50 uh, ballot styles. Uh, any other questions, facts that you might want to know? Dave, I knew you would. <laughs> Councilman Rosenberg. Thanks, thanks, Bobby. It's great to finally see you. Nice, nice to see you. <laughs> um, what's the criteria that you use to decide whether to add a polling place in a council district or, or whatever you, you do? Well, obviously, we're limited to 6,000 registered voters. We cannot exceed 6,000 registered voters. But uh, first, we look at public facilities first. Schools are always the best locations. and we were able to convince the school board they're going to use a in-service day for May the 3rd. They were already closed for August and November, so it's going to work out perfect for us. And uh, But it all comes down to geographically the location and where I kind of know where the block of voters are. We try to have it centrally located. As you know, it's, sometimes it doesn't work, but uh, we can move a line to the shift the line as far as a precinct line to the left or right and, you know, we don't want someone to cross the interstate to vote. For example, we found I've locked down my last polling location last night. So everyone that would be east of Interstate 40 would vote at Gower, then west, I guess it would be, would vote at this new church that we located. Yeah, it's not easy, believe me. Gotcha, okay, yeah, I saw it looks like everybody east of Old Hickory is gonna be voting at the, that church on Sonia. That was quite a find, I didn't That was a find, it, was, there, yeah. it actually, nice people, they're eager to help, and we hope it might even uh, help them out also. It's gonna be a win-win for both of us. That's great, thank you. I'll, I'll try to keep the more data geekery for another time. Yeah. Appreciate it. Councilwoman Gamble. Thank you, Chair, for recognizing me as I'm not on the Rules Committee. Thank you all for being here. I do have a question about the uh, number or percentage of voters that may, be, may have to vote at a new polling place as a result of the districting, redistricting. Do you have that number? And also, how will those voters be notified and when that they will be voting at a new polling place? I'll let Jeff talk first about when they're going to be notified for the voter cards, then I can fill you in on some numbers. So the, we had all the voter cards ready to go. They were at the printer. Printer had already printed 100,000. Lawsuit was filed. We had to stop 
hold everything. The lawsuit was settled last night. We've given the, uh, the printer the go ahead. So hopefully the game plan would be you would get those in the mail with enough time for the May 3rd election. Keep in mind, early voting, you can vote anywhere. You don't have to know what your precinct location is. So redistricting slowed us down. We had two lawsuits to determine who was on the ballot. Then we had the lawsuit with the state. It's been difficult for us to make it all come together. The sample ballot, you should have, hopefully, received your sample ballot in the mail. Um, even that one pushed us right up to the edge uh, to get that information to you. But it's on its way. The cards are on their way. Different color, they will be white. Not as heavy a card stock because supply chain printer can't get the paper. So we're going lighter card stock on white paper, um, but everything will be um, on there. So that's that's the plan right now. Absent any more lawsuits. So as far as numbers or picking a polling location, I'll just use the first two, for example. Georgia First Baptist Church is a large facility. I know we have approximately 3,187 registered voters. Uh, the next polling location or Council District 1, Precinct 2, is Scottsboro Community Center. So it's a small facility, limited parking. I bet, I've just been doing it so long. I just know the rooms, the parking area. I can visualize it, and we kind of know what works and what doesn't. Now, that's not going to say that we might have some overlaps. For example, in we, we, when we went from, in the 2010 census, we went from 166 to 172 polling locations. After a couple elections, we kind of see where everybody's going and voting. Do they vote early? Do they not? And we were able to reduce that to our current number pre redistricting to 160. So it's just, we're going to be tweaking it for the next couple years. And it just, it, it all works out. So is there a large percentage of, of voters that will be moving to new voting precincts? Absolutely. Okay, yep. and do you have a, a, a number? Gauge? I would guess probably around 70%. Yeah. Or it, they might not have the same number, for example. So 12-3 used to be, I think, DuPont Tyler Middle. Now it's 12-4. So it just kind of throws them off. And I can think our chairman said that uh, they had a, she has a new school board member, school board representative. So everything's changed. I mean, just to give you an example, the, what I've discovered, the public really doesn't know their precinct number at all. They remember the where I voted. Um, even an example of, so in Bellevue where I live, we have early voting at the library. If we don't take down the campaign signs when early voting ends on election day, we will have a line of people there because they think, because there's campaign signs out, I can vote here. Um, it's, and we've, we've tried everything we know of, you know. I don't know that I could get on TV any more than I was back in 2020 to get you know people in the right direction. We did pretty good, I think, um, but it's going to be a learning process this first time out for sure. Okay, I'm just going down. Oh, no, you're fine, Councilwoman Johnston. Just lean up. Our technology is awesome. Um, is there an update on the Ellington Agricultural polling location? Because it's been, we've merged sort of with the, and this is super selfish because it's mine, <laughs> but it's been sort of, we don't know what's going on for probably years now, I think, and we've got, everybody's gone to Creepwood Baptist, which is working perfectly fine, but everybody's like, when are we going back to our normal polling location? Well, so we did have a double at Creepwood because of the Ellington situation, and so we just found that Creepwood works the best. So we're going to 
stick with Creedwood. I, they got good parking. And as you know, if you're not familiar with that Ellen Tag Crush Center, it's, you'll get lost in there. Yeah. So uh, we're going to just stick with Creedwood and, and see how it works this election. I bumped the voters up just a little bit. And like I said, we'll tweak it a little after this election and even August. Councilman Rutherford. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just uh, full disclosure for anyone who may not be aware, um, I was on staff at the Election Commission at, uh, at one time many years ago, uh, and had worked uh, previously as a as a poll official as, as well. Uh, and I, I wanted to ask, um, in regards to the staffing of uh, all the polling places, w where does that stand now with the Election Commission in terms of your staffing level for uh, polling officials and uh, recruitment of new uh, poll officials and training, and in particular, the division between the Ds and the Rs, which I, I know has, has always been a little bit uh, lopsided on that. We've got right now, or, or let's, let's go back to 2020, we had 6,000 applications for poll officials for 2020. So naturally we'll lose some of those people because the excitement of a presidential election is not there. But we still feel like we have a fairly good size bench as far as uh, total poll officials that we would need here in Davidson County. We have been putting an effort to hire more Republican poll officials so that we can get that mix appropriate as required by state law. And we've been uh, pretty successful. We've been working with the Republican Party here in Davidson County uh, to try to get us more names of individuals. And, and so would you say that you're, you're finding some success in, in, in that? For, in, Yes, we, we think we will be uh, in, relatively speaking, good shape compared to where we've been in the past. Uh, it, you know, it's just tough to get people really to want to work outside their neighborhood, especially um, our, the traditional age of poll workers. They don't like to go, venture too far out, but we have uh, a lot more younger folks that are signing up to be a poll official. Uh, we think uh, businesses are, it's considered some of your community service responsibility. So we have younger people signing up and they don't mind to drive wherever we need them. So that's helping out a lot. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councilman Rutherford. Um, can you can you speak to what's the requirements to become a poll official and, and how they apply? It's pretty simple. You're a registered voter in Davidson County. Uh, we do um, AJ Styling. for... Tell AJ you're in a meeting. Yeah, I'm gonna have to tell AJ, I have to call him back. <laughs> he just called me. Uh, okay. So, um, can you, what was the question again? Uh, the requirements. Requirements. <laughs> requirements. Oh, yeah. You can go on our website and register online. Uh, we've even made an attempt to work with Metro Purchasing to do a lot of the paperwork. You do it through DocuSign, so you don't have to come out to our office and uh, go through some of that paperwork stuff. We can do, uh, we're working on doing interviews um, through uh, either WebEx or something similar, just so that we, we want to get a feel for kind of, you know, who you are and what your interests are before we definitely sign you up. But it's a pretty easy process. Uh, the key for us is once someone files an application, we want to, as quickly as possible, follow up with them. They get an email. We do everything through email now. Um, just because we can communicate quickly. If you think back to uh, the 2020 tornadoes, absent email, we would have been struggling to get people in the right place. Uh, but that, that gave us a lot of flexibility uh, to address the issues that we had with the tornadoes. Okay. Um 
Um, I have a question too. Um, community engagement. Um, oh, did you have a question, Councilman no, Rosenberg? No, you, you want me to come back to you? I'll come back to you. You can go ahead, Councilman Rosenberg. Thank you, Madam Chair. Welcome to wait after till after you. Okay. Um, I just want to, you know, I think there was an expectation or at least a hope that the chair of the election commission was going to accept the invitation to come and um, share his position on things that are going on. I think it's important to delineate between our election office and the election commission. Um, first of all, thank you all for being here. It's nice to talk to you all by email a lot more than I ever get to see you in person, so thank you. Um, but also, our election office is extremely competent, and right now they're doing it on the head of a pin by dealing with all the mess of redistricting, running an election, and handling filing deadlines that are shifting around by or lawsuits for the August election at the same time, um, and also the campaign finance elements and dealing with voter education in a state that doesn't like voters to be educated, and a lot of different things. So thank you all for, I don't know if y'all work 90 or 120 hours a week, but I appreciate it. Um, you can contrast that with our election commission, um, which seems to be purely a partisan body is, and, and is engaged in this lawsuit on behalf of a private organization. And I'm really disappointed that Jim Delanis decided to uh, stay home or go out for a drink or whatever, instead of answering why they're chasing after this lawsuit and so irresponsibly spending um, taxpayer dollars, doing it seemingly an unlimited amount without any real, um, it all seems to be pretty well baked behind the scenes. Um, so I think, you know, I think there's plenty of ire that needs to be directed that way, both for their actions throughout the year and for not showing up today. But as for our election office, um, we can be extremely grateful that we continue to have as smooth an election as you can have, given all the factors that go on time after time. And I just appreciate y'all for that very much. And I worked with, uh, um, the, the chair here to um, the agenda was pretty broad and the commission really can't speak to the details that we've spoken about here I'm sure if you want the commission to come back to speak you know just on uh, the subject of lawsuits and those kind of things uh, they were all open to do that um, so you know maybe a future date uh, you could have them in to do that they were invited today though, right? They were invited. Okay. Um, I, I told the, the chair that they couldn't really speak to anything that was on the, the agenda that was provided. So um, I would be bringing the experts that could speak to each of those items. Okay. It was my understanding that questions surrounding the lawsuits were part of the agenda, but I appreciate that. Thank you, look forward to it. And I, I just want to piggyback on Councilman Rosenberg's uh, question, just so that the viewing, the viewing audience, that they understand the distinction between um, you guys and, and the actual commission. Right. The commission is, is appointed by the legislative body from Davidson County, and we operate within what they direct us to do and is what's guided by state laws to actually put on election, register voters in Davidson County. And if I could add to that, so the, 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 in any county, regardless of the breakdown of that county, the majority party in the legislature gets to put three commissioners on, the minority party gets to put two on. So we have, um, 14 legislators that represent Davidson County, 13 of them are Democrats. The 13 Democrats pick two members and the one Republican who actually lives in Sumner County but represents part of Davidson County appoints the majority of our election commission. Yes, sir, that's my understanding. Thank you. How long is the term that they're appointed for? They are appointed for two years. Two years. So I think it's important for for the body um, and, and the viewing audience when they see headlines as it relates to the lawsuits that is is not is not you guys leading leading that leading that effort that that's that's more the commission is that accurate? That's correct, right? 
depending on the outcome of lawsuits, we may or may not uh, initiate an, uh, an election to be uh, held here in Davidson County, provide the staffing and all of those type things. Did you have any further questions, Councilman Rosenberg? I have one about community community outreach. Um, do we have those numbers, those historical voting numbers? I think you provided them earlier, Bobby. What, the voter turnout and what we can do to, um, to encourage voter turnout to help you guys. Sure, let me, let me give you some highlights. Um, if we look at November of 2018, we had 246,000 people vote in Davidson County. That was a record for us for that particular election. Um, for the September 6th, 2018 vice mayor runoff election, now keep in mind that was a off year kind of mayoral. Special election. Special election. Uh, we only had 30,200 people vote. For the May primary in 2018, we had 125,100 people. But included in that was the uh, transit referendum, which caused a lot more people than normal to vote. Uh, normally for this election, you're probably looking at 50, 60,000 people, something like that. Now, because for we have- For this May primary? For this May primary, because of the uh, partisan school board races, that number could be bumped up a little bit. Uh, we just don't know. We've never experienced uh, the partisan school board. Um, the November 2020, we had 312,000 people vote in Davidson County out of a total of uh, 480,000 registered voters. The, the information I'm giving you, if you, it's it's on our website, so you can go out and and scroll through that. If you have a particular election you're looking for, we're trying to get the website to where it's a little more self-service. You can go out there, figure out what we do, what you need to to know to run as a candidate, file your financial disclosures, or just gather information uh, if you're doing a school project or whatever on voting. Uh, the information is there. What about purging of, of voters? So the the law, the state law changed a few years ago um, that prior to that time, if you had not voted in, I want to say it, it was either two or maybe four presidential elections, um, we could purge you just for that reason. But the law was changed to say that we had to have something returned back from, to us. So an item that we expect here in the next month, all the voter registration cards that we send out, there will be a lot that are not deliverable. People, it's not the first thing they do is let us know they've moved to Williamson County or Montana. So we'll have a lot of voter registration cards that are returned to us as not deliverable. The law requires us then to reach out with, the re voter registration card is not forwardable. So the post office will not send that to your new address. We will then follow that with a, a postcard type notice that is forwardable to try to reach out to that individual to see if maybe, you know, okay, I've moved down the street or I've got a different apartment number, something uh, that would let us know I'm still a registered voter here in Davidson County and I plan on uh, voting going forward. If we don't hear from that voter, the voter doesn't vote, doesn't sign a petition, something uh, to let us know they're still here in Davidson County at that address, they will be purged after two November elections. So it's a pretty drawn out process, uh, but 
it's, it's a good way for us to try to keep the rolls as clean as possible for voters that live in Davidson County. Now to go with that, big question we get asked all the time, how about dead people? What do you do? We have approximately 500 people, 500 people in Davidson County dying every month. Uh, and we get a monthly report from the state once that death certificate is generated. And at that point, we take you off the rolls. We don't take you off because your spouse calls in and says you've died, because you may not have died. They just don't like you anymore. <laughs> um, so, you know, it's a very kind of official process, and we can then note in your record you were purged as being deceased based on this state report. Councilwoman Johnston. Thank you. So from the time that someone uh, does not receive their registration card because they've moved to Murfreesboro, um, and it comes back to you, you send the postcard, they don't respond because they don't care because right. they don't live here anymore. Right. They are not going to be taken off the registered voters list until 2024? 2024. That's correct. Okay. Because that's so it, that's that can be we got a lot of people moving in and out. We do, and that number can swing a lot. And one of the right. charter amendments that we're about to put forth bases petitions and referendums and all that fun stuff on a certain number of registered voters. So that number is quite important. Um, that's you're saying that's that's a state law though. So that's nothing. That's correct. Yeah. That's, a, that's a state awesome. law as to um, how voters are purged. And they're, they're, even the process is defined in, in state law. Okay. All right. Thank you. So does that mean that that number you're working with, Councilwoman Johnston, is going to be skewed? Well, I mean, the number is, yeah, it's potentially not very accurate as far as who's well, I mean, they're all, I guess, registered, but are they actually supposed to be registered? Do you know what I mean? I mean, there's nothing that you got. I'm not criticizing you. You're not doing anything wrong. I just think that's, um, we could have had 50,000, 100,000 people move out of the county, and we can't reflect that on our registered voters list for two years. So when when we get a piece of mail returned back to us so the voter registration card comes back to us we will go into that person's record and we will mark them as inactive really doesn't impact that person because they can still vote if they vote we change them back to active um, but it, what it tells us it starts that clock ticking and it generates the letter that we will send to the person that's forwardable and it starts that process. Um, so. So if someone was to call your office and say, okay, we've got 480,000 registered voters, how many are active? You can say that number. We can tell you how many are active as com because we can also tell how many have been marked as inactive because we've had a piece of mail come back to us that's not deliverable. There's some reason for us to think maybe this person doesn't live in Davidson County anymore. And they haven't voted either. Obviously. Well, we don't look at whether or not they voted because the no. state law doesn't allow us to do that. You can't mark them inactive? No. Just because, wait. No. We can only mark them inactive if we send them a piece of correspondence that comes back to us is not deliverable. Right. Okay. All right. I'm sorry because I'm trying to. No, it's it's a it's a very complicated kind of drawn out piece. I think what we're trying to do is make sure, or the state's trying to do, that people aren't just purged, you know, kind of willy nilly. Right. I There's get a, that. Process. If, if someone is marked inactive because a piece of mail has come back undeliverable and then they show up the next election to vote, are they then put back, back into the active? Automatically back to active. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Now, we will ask them, hey, something about your address is a problem. Right. Could be as simple as you forgot to give us your apartment number. 
those kind of things. Uh, and it's not unheard of that the post office can make a mistake. Uh, do you know off the top of your head how many active voters we have out of the 480,000? I can tell you we've got about, well, about 450. About 30,000 of those are inactive. Okay. Now, that number could go up a lot because we're sending a piece of mail out to every voter. Yeah. So it could go, but right. But right now, right about now. 450 right. active Right. out of 480. Right, and, and keep in mind, number of inactive. in addition to the dead people, we also get a report from the state on a regular basis of this person's now registered in Wilson County or Perry County. We then have, we'll go in and take them off of our uh, rolls. And because of where we are located and the donut counties, that is, it's more than a full-time job. That's all this person does is, you know, correct people that have moved out of county. But within Tennessee, you don't get those reports from other states? On occasion, we get something from another state, but it's not like we get from uh, in-state. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much for that. Councilman Rutherford. Thank you, Chair. Um, I have a question in regards to uh, social media and uh, information on the internet. Uh, you shared with us in the very beginning of the of the meeting that you have someone dedicated to uh, social media, and you introduced us to her uh, kindly, um, and we appreciate that. Um, my question is. In terms of social media and information on the internet, are, are you are you doing anything to um, uh, correct or counter um, inaccurate information that may be there in regards to election administration? I would say certainly if it's something that is um, grossly incorrect, yes, we're, we're trying to um, put out, counter it, I guess you could say, with the correct information. Um, sometimes people don't get things exactly right, but it's not going to you know, cause a major issue. Um, but yeah, um, rather than, I guess, um, slapping their hands, we just try to come back with uh, the right information. And I know in 2020, there was a lot that was out there that was not accurate. And so we started calling ourselves the election experts. And, um, you know, maybe some people uh, agreed with us, um, but that's, that's about all we could do. Well, you, you should be the election experts, uh, I would say, in terms of election administration. Um, and so do you actively pursue that, or is this, this just correcting what you happen to encounter? I don't know if I understand what you mean by actively pursue. Uh, are, are, you, are, are you actively looking for falsehoods in regards to election administration, or, or are you just correcting what you happen to come across in your, in your daily duties? I mean, I'm reviewing as regularly as possible what's out there, um, but you know, you can't catch everything. Um, yeah, probably was pouring over so social media a little bit more um, in 2020 um, because we did recognize that there was a lot of um, uh, incorrect information being communicated, and people would pick it, pick up that incorrect information, and run with it. So. Um, uh, I don't know if that answers your question, but it, it, it does, and I and I appreciate the the, the effort on on that. You no, know, looking back at 2020, one of the thing, first things I would do with well Lisa in the morning was okay, what's what's trending on tr Twitter because Twitter's where it can happen quickly and get out of control if we're not kind of watching what's going on. I'll give you an example. Close to the deadline for mailing in your absentee ballot, uh, Twitter um, had some information about the post office would accept it up until four o'clock. In Davidson County, our Broadway post office, we, it doesn't close till five o'clock. 
So we had to make sure that everyone in Davidson County knows you have until five o'clock to get your absentee ballot down to the post off office and you need to hand deliver it inside at that point in time. So it's a little hand holding that we try to do. And like Lisa said, we have to be careful that we don't slap down anyone else or we'll spend all of our time in an argument with someone that doesn't benefit the Davidson County voters. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And, and we monitor next door. That's a pretty, pretty big one. A lot of conversations going on there and Facebook. And I'll just say that um, many um, council members uh, follow us and many um, share and like and comment whatever on what we put out there. And that's really appreciated because I think that um, the voters of Davidson County are paying attention to what you all are saying. And so when you pick up something that we've put out and, and share it with your constituency, you know, it just helps to get the messaging out e even more. So thank you for that and keep doing it. And um, um, certainly if you see something that is incorrect, that you feel like needs we need to address, let us know because um, I'm, you know, it takes a lot of time to scroll through all of those tweets and <laughs> uh, posts, and uh, so yeah, I, you know, we could miss something. So let us know. No, in addition to that, you guys are the eyes and ears in your community. If you're seeing something, especially on election day or during early voting, a long line, you know, they haven't opened or they closed or is this true call me email me you know um dave lives across the river from me so he, he he reaches out to me whenever he has a an issue but everyone should feel the opportunity to do the same uh we'll try to get back to you just as quick as we can with a good answer councilman rosenberg Thank you. Um, that reminds me, we just talk a little bit about who's responsible for what happens inside 100 feet and outside 100 feet at polling places. <laughs> That's a good one, Councilman. <laughs> right. So I'll, I'll give you an example. Uh, we had complaints this week uh, from the Metro employees that work on the Fulton complex about an individual with a bullhorn disturbing their work environment. As long as that individual is outside the 100 foot boundary, we have no authority control at all. Now we did reach out to general services to see if they could have a conversation with them. Uh, I, on occasion, have contacted candidates to say, hey, you know, this may not be generating as many votes as you think. In fact, it could be the opposite. So things like that, let us know. Uh, we need your help. Campaign signs on the side of the road, we have no authority at all. Um, so public works, if it's blocking the right of way, those kind of things, uh, contact the, uh, the new Nashville Department of Transportation. I think we probably could end on <clears throat> community engagement and, and resources, um, just so how uh, council members, we can just continue to partner with you guys and increase in voter engagement. Um, I do believe we discussed uh, voter registration, how that's trending uh, currently now, what, and what we can do to help you guys. Sure. Um, so what we've seen with the, the advent of the state's new online voter registration, that is where we get most of the registrations, new registrations and, and change of address. People have become more and more hesitant about filling out a voter registration card and handing it to someone they don't know, whether or not it's at a fair or whatever. So when we get those voter registration cards without the social security number on it, 
what that does, you're causing Metro to have to spend money for us to mail them a letter to get their voter registration card. It's considered incomplete at that point, and they, they have to vote a provisional ballot. So one of the things that we're trying to um, determine if, if this is a good way to go is we've, we can provide these to all the council folks. It's a, it's a business card that has simple information on there of how to register online. On the back, it tells you how, if you wanna be a poll official, you can uh, go to this website and be a poll official. You know, one of the things that is a challenge for us is we go to a festival or a fair at the request of a council member or state representative. We get there and uh, the League of Women Voters is there, the Democratic Party's there, the Republican Party's there, and we're like, you've got four different organizations registering people to vote. And Metro is paying overtime for this person to sit in a booth. The state went to the predator, one of the Predators home games here in the last month. So there's like 20,000 people. They had seven voter registrations total. We went to, at the request of uh, the Secretary of State, to a church in North Nashville, um, and we had zero. People are not as inclined to register in that fashion anymore. Uh, they can go to our website, pull down the registration form, fill it out and mail it to us. When you, you, you can do it at the Department of Safety online at the kiosk. Uh, so I'll, we think people, that's, that's where they're going. We probably get, um, right now, I would say 85% of our registrations either through the online voter registration or the Department of Safety. People just do not put them in the mail anymore. And you know, the worst thing for me before the 2018 election is talking to someone on the phone. They thought they were registering to vote with someone and they gave them all their personal information. This was at a mall. They had no clue. We didn't get it. We don't know what, who they gave all their information to. So it, it's a different world out there and we've got to think of new ways to try to reach out, out to people to make sure they know how easy it is to register to vote in Tennessee. When we have these, these organizations that host the, the voter registration events, essentially they're the stewards of, of the citizens' private information. Do, do we require them to go through some type of voter registration training and we, or, or can just any organization host a voter registration drive? We, we provide them a packet of information. Uh, it's got kind of a checklist on there on of the here, here's what you need to do to make sure um, you're taking care of that voter's important information. Um, you know, it's in the past, people have had voter registration cards rolling around in the trunk of their car for a year or so and then they bring them in and we wonder why the date that was signed on there was two years previous. Um, it's just problematic. Okay, any more questions? Um, thank you committee members for, for requesting um, the, uh, the election commission, excuse me, to come before us. Um, it, it clearly, it wasn't, it wasn't a thought for me. I hope it's been very informative for you and also for, for the viewing audience. Just wanna let um, those watching know that early voting uh, is underway. Um, do you wanna do that, Jeff, or? Sure. Okay, I wanna steal your thunder. Early, early voting uh, runs through? The 28th, oh, go ahead. The uh, 28th. The first week of early voting is just at Howard School on the Fulton Complex. On the 
20th, we will open up at all of those community sites that uh, you're used to uh, for early voting to continue. Keep in mind, like tonight, Tuesdays and Thursdays are late nights. We're open till seven. Wednesdays and Saturdays, we close at 4.30. Monday and Friday, it's 5.30. We open at eight o'clock every morning. So if you, you should have received your sample ballot in the mail, included in that sample ballot is the schedule for early voting and some other information that uh, could be helpful. So any questions on early voting? What to expect? And Bobby reminded me, your voter card is not needed to vote, your voter registration card. What you do need is a photo ID, a federal or state issued photo ID. We're looking at the photo. Make sure this is you. Okay, I don't have anything else. Committee members, uh, for those that's left, do you have any? All right, thank you so much for coming before us. Um, Y'all have a happy uh, weekend and uh, we are adjourned. This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again or for more information on this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.